Why is it that Bethesda games have progressively gotten worse? And while it's a subjective question, it's not entirely incorrect. We'll be looking into that, along with diving into Starfield more specifically, uncovering its many flaws, and taking a look at the entire main story, to figure out what the intention of the game was, and what we actually ended up with. Then, finally, looking to the future of Bethesda. Generally speaking, games used to be more difficult, beginning with arcade games having to be harder to keep players inserting coins. And this philosophy carried over to consoles, but in a different way. Games used to be extremely short due to memory limitations. However, that time could be increased artificially, with much more difficult enemies to deal with, set save locations and limited lives and so on requiring you to take your time and think, doing the same sections of games repeatedly, turning that two hours into 50 even. But developers also had more freedom to innovate within those limitations. As technology advanced and the gaming industry grew, so did the audience. Priorities were placed on accessibility and making them more approachable to the largest possible demographics. And as a result, over time, games have become more streamlined by including guided tutorials, objective markers, simplified mechanics and interfaces. While this made gaming more welcoming to newcomers, it came at the cost of complexity and depth. It is very possible to have both, of course, but for the majority of AAA titles, the focus has been placed on the side of capturing the largest market. Looking at Bethesda specifically, let's start with Daggerfall, one of the earliest Elder Scrolls titles. With a ridiculous amount of skills to choose from and the ability to set your own advantages and disadvantages that change how you interact with the game and so much variety you're free to choose what you want to do. If you don't like one aspect of the game, do another. You're not locked into one way of playing. Its map size is approximately 161,600 kilometers. That's roughly around the size of the United Kingdom. Daggerfall is more akin to a life simulator in terms of role-playing elements and size. Morrowind opts for a fully handcrafted, rich and detailed, but much smaller world filled with unique locations. It won't hold your hand in the slightest. You had to invest. You had to learn the culture of the land you were in, the public transport routes, because there was no real fast travel. You need to read your journal to find directions to quest locations. You had to pay attention. Combat-wise, in the beginning, you are useless, to the point you may even die to the first rat you face on your journey. But as you progress through the game, you will become a god. With Oblivion, we get the introduction of Radiant AI, a system that allows NPCs to have unique interactions and behaviours, to dynamically react and interact within the world. Having different NPCs have different goals, like eat in this location at 5pm or travel to the next town over and stay with a friend, aided tremendously in what Todd Howard described as an organic feel. Each of these games innovated in different ways, but also removed elements of the prior titles. One of the mechanics that is present in Daggerfall, Morrowind and Oblivion is spellmaking, for example. The ability to customise and tailor spells to your liking. And they could be incredibly broken if you wanted. You could fly or jump across the map, become permanently invisible create a destruction spell that looked like it could level a small village. Skyrim, on the other hand, does away with this, along with many other things, but is far more accessible than previous titles. Skyrim is simplified, but within that simplification comes a mass appeal and a much more immersive, vibrant world. Fallout 4 follows a similar route in comparison to Fallout 3, 
It does away with skills and has instead rolled them into perks. So instead of the ability to, for example, specialize in a more specific playstyle, you're limited just by picking perks and removing all perk and skill specific dialogue checks, thus removing several RPG elements. The largest and most controversial change in Fallout 4 is the addition of a voiced protagonist. Whilst vastly increasing accessibility and likely one of the reasons why it's the most popular Fallout game to date, limited many, many factors of what constitutes a Bethesda game. Having a voice protagonist limits you in how you can view yourself. The inflections are set in stone, with no nuance to how you perceive your character would say things. You remove content by simply having a voice. The voice actor is stuck with the background, personality and morality the game has set. You're limited on how much can be said and in the variety of ways they can be delivered. Which is not an issue if you have the writing talent to back it up. A lot of the time you'll choose one dialogue option just for your character to say something completely different. The trade-off, however, is smoother combat, the addition of settlement building, improved crafting, the ability to sprint, and of course, having a voice. And you might like these changes, you might even love the settlement building and voice to the point you won't touch the previous Fallout titles. And that's why this is so divisive. Because your love or hate of Bethesda games is more than likely largely based on your own entry point. Say you began with Fallout 3, the first time you left Vault 101, the natural sunlight blinding you, your eyes gradually acclimating, revealing this vast wasteland for you to explore. That experience sticks with you. Or in Starfield, the first time you landed on a planet, roaming its surface, that first realization hitting you like a wave, that there is nothing for you to do <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, um, yeah, we'll, we'll save that for later. So, my introduction to Bethesda Studios was the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion on the Xbox 360. The world felt alive. Exiting the sewers for the first time is etched in my mind forever. The side quests and exploration are unrivaled to me. The bugs, the goofiness, and the fact that only 10 voice actors voiced over 900 characters was and still is charming to me. It's the one game my mom sat down and enjoyed watching me play. All of these things are reasons why Oblivion has a special place in my heart. Could I play Daggerfall? Maybe, but the scale and the idea of it being mostly procedurally generated doesn't particularly hold my attention. Could I play Morrowind? Within the first 10 minutes die to a rat because I messed up my stat investment? Return to where I died to witness a wizard screaming and falling from the sky. Loot him for some interesting scrolls. Curiously, test out the scrolls to suddenly leap into the sky and fall to my death. Spend time reading the interesting lore, lose myself in a hand-drawn and fascinatingly unique alien-looking world. I could, and have, but it's definitely a different mindset in comparison to the comfort and relaxation I feel with Oblivion or Skyrim. But then I don't like Skyrim as much for its simplifications. The point is, if you started with Skyrim, more than likely that's your favourite Elder Scrolls game. If you started with Morrowind, you might swear by Morrowind and everything else is garbage. Or you might have grown to find comfort in the later titles. It could be considered synonymous with nostalgia, but it's deeper than re-experiencing or looking back on something you cherish, and then basing future experiences with that standard. We all have different definitions of what worse is or what a Bethesda game means to us. 
One thing, however, that is indisputable is that each new installment has less depth. So let's take a look at Starfield. While this is a new IP, this is in the same vein as the Elder Scrolls and Fallout series, just a different coat of paint. Fantasy, post-apocalyptic sci-fi, and finally sci-fi. Completing the trifecta, that's really the only difference. The engine that runs this is almost exactly the same, so we're bound to draw comparisons, and I certainly will be. You bet your ass it's your problem. You kidding me? Way to make a mess in front of my new room. In Starfield, there will be a moment that completely flicks a switch in your brain that allows you to see it for what it really is. It could be as simple as going through five loading screens within 50 seconds, or it could be returning from a side quest to then witness your quest giver levitating into the ceiling. There you are. You were gone for quite a while, love. Or you're faced with a quest chain that only has nonsensical outcomes, when very clearly in your brain there is only one outcome. That should really be a possibility. The purpose of video games, more specifically this genre, is to sell to you that the world you've been transported into is real. That you have your own autonomy in this virtual world. That your choices matter. That your exploration and intrigue will be compensated. That the more you put time and effort into investing in this universe, the more rich and more fulfilling your experience will be. And while previous titles hold many of the same issues, they were bugs within the system, byproducts of innovative game design due to the variety of options given to the player, along with technical limitations and taking risks. They had character. There was a sense of passion. Technology has evolved, so why have we backpedaled so far to the point that Starfield is somehow seemingly the most realistic yet least immersive of any previous Bethesda game? Starfield is stagnant. Bethesda is stagnating. Every single implementation of prior mechanics is a downgrade in some shape or form of previous titles, and each new mechanic is constrained in terms of depth. Melee weapons have less thought put into them than ever before. There are less than a handful of weapons, and I do mean that literally. The melee upgradable skills are nothing but damage boosts. You have a three-hit combo and a power attack. That's it. There are no directional attacks that offer different ranges or effects. Daggerfall had directional attacks. Daggerfall was 30 years ago. You could argue that, you know, technology has advanced. A fire axe won't do anything to these futuristic spacesuits, while these laser beams will indiscriminately pierce anything. But you can also argue that maybe there are some far more tanky suits requiring strength stats to wear that mitigate lasers with weapons that incorporate this new technology and vaporize anything in its path, or a fist weapon utilizing space hydraulics to crush anything. It's as if melee combat was an afterthought, thrown in lazily to appease those unsure why it's present in all previous games but this one. Lockpicking is now a far more tedious minigame, Yet finding picks is harder than it's ever been. The rewards are almost non-existent. The amount of time you spend, a minute picking a lock, to be rewarded with maybe a half-eaten sandwich is impressive. So eventually you'll get bored of even doing that, risking the possibility of maybe for once getting some good loot, just because eventually it is that boring. The faction quests are bland, which is unfortunate because some of them show promise in the beginning, 
just to fall off a cliff halfway through. Then we have the stealth system, somehow worse than the already terrible stealth systems in every other game. You have people noticing you from two rooms away or two floors down, Companions that seem to completely disregard the need for subtlety, running all over the place, alerting everything, resulting in guards teleporting through walls to catch you when you were hidden. I'm holding you for trespassing. What's most confusing is there is a faction in this game based around corporate espionage, rewarding you for the more stealthy and charismatic choices. Bethesda has gone through many evolutions of how to do persuasion. Oblivion had a wheel minigame you'd play, picking options based on the most positive facial expressions. Fallout 3 went with RNG, and raising your odds with charisma and speech skills. There were dialogue options based on unique perks you chose and your special skills, along with your current moral standing. Skyrim is really just for barter prices and a few quests, I think. Fallout 4 is entirely based on a singular charisma stat and is RNG based. And somehow, Starfield has the worst system of them all. For two reasons. Generally, the writing is just bad. But the main offender here is, it's selling you on a lie. It looks intricate. You're given what feels like contextual lines color-coded based on success rate, tailored towards your current situation who you're speaking to and their personality and temperament. The riskier the choice, the more points gained. In terms of colour-coded risk, this is true. But in terms of tailoring your words to who you're speaking to, that's not actually real. What's going on is you're pulling from a library of generic lines shared with every other NPC in the game that can be persuaded with a few unique lines more fitting to the situation you're in and the person you're speaking to. But even if these unique lines are tailored and your knowledge of who you're speaking to allows you to pick what you deem to be the most fitting choice, that invisible percentage isn't changing. There is no correlation between the written text changing any probabilities. For example, you can attempt to persuade a guard to give you his security card and every single speech option is just pulled from the give me this item generic lines folder. The argument is not that it's RNG or anything, it's that the approach taken is to fake depth. These interactions aren't unique at all. Most role-playing games tailor dialogue choices, backed up with good writing, then you can throw RNG onto that and sprinkle in some higher chances on saying things that actually make sense. Almost everything in this game is trying so hard to convince you that it's layered and sophisticated, and you're just peeling away layer after layer until you reveal there's nothing there. Starfield is a game of boxes. You traverse through hundreds, thousands of boxes in your playthrough. In your ship in space, that's a box. Maybe there's nothing in the box. Maybe some meteors or some enemy ships. Maybe an old granny has invited you into her box to eat her sweet rolls. I've got plenty. I hope you're hungry. And as I say that, I think to myself, why did I say that? But at the same time, that's literally what happened. So... You want to go into another box, right? Load into this planet. No, you can't fly to it. You're in a box. You're in another box now. A virtually void box planet. Spend two to four minutes running to this point of interest. You made it. You're in an empty building. New box. You look around for a few minutes and find... nothing. Lockpick these chests for meaningless loot. Leave that box back to the lifeless planet, then fast travel out of that box into your ship. Then fast travel out of that box into a lively city. Each lingering transition, each loading screen, groaning at you, asking you, Why are you doing this? Odd. 
Nobody is talking to each other, they're simply walking aimlessly or standing meaninglessly. Yet they will stare at you through vacant eyes. Sometimes you may notice people's faces and bodies change if you take your eyes off them for even a second. That's odd, isn't it? They will walk by you and tell you about this interesting person on a planet far away that you didn't ask about. You are the only thing that matters in this world. Once in a while you may stumble upon two people naturally talking, but when you approach they begin to longingly stare at you, as if you're some unique, exotic animal. Huh. Maybe you're not in a box. Maybe you're in a cage. The focal point of the entire universe. Eternally observed. Never able to escape the confines without permission. Always needing to go through the customs process before being allowed into yet another cage. There's a very distinct lack of immersion in everything, from exploration to just how NPCs function. See, in previous games, the majority of NPCs were named. Add on top of that the addition of Radiant AI with Oblivion, but that was removed after Fallout 4. I suppose I can understand why. The scale of these games can't afford to incorporate it. The cities are so large that, to make them feel lived in, you need an abundance of nameless NPCs. But that doesn't feel alive. They provide nothing to the world if all they do is roam without purpose. I get it, but I don't have to like it. Especially when it didn't have to be this way. Which brings us to the fact that Bethesda is out of touch. The creation engine is guilty of many faults with the game but it cannot account for a loss of passion and vision, and it cannot account for always thinking bigger is better, gradually sacrificing absolutely everything for a sense of shallow yet gargantuan size. You've created a brand new detailed shipbuilder with specification and expertise requirements, while allowing for the creativity of players to make many unique types of spaceships Yet they can't go anywhere with these creations. They spend hours creating the perfect ship to be restricted to a cage. And at what cost? Games cost more to make than they used to, so they're on a balanced beam of resources. In-depth shipbuilder and outpost builder to be restricted to a cage. A bare-bones melee system or a much wider variety of guns. 1,000 plus procedurally generated barren planets, but 1,000 plus planets, or a richly detailed and densely packed handcrafted solar system. Taking all of this into account, what exactly is the intention of Starfield? What experience is this whole package trying to provide? I think we can glean some answers from that with how they went about the main story. And so we begin our journey, on our second day working as a miner on the moon of Vectera. We're introduced to Lynn and Hella. Lynn informs you that mining is just like any other job, and that all you need to do is go steady, go safe, and get home with a pocket full of credits. Now I work in the Stardock, except uh, with more cave-ins, lasers, and accidental dismemberment. For future reference, Heller is like the comedic relief, except there's never any relief, and you'll never see him again after this intro. Because when given a mission to find him later in the game, I completely skipped it, and I'm very happy with my decision. That's why I keep him around. Good pep talks. Yeah, and- We make our way through the caves, and Lynn gives me a cutter and puts me to work. She then radios in later on to tell me they're ready to continue. Hella picks up some weird and dangerous readings on the mining scanner thingy, and Lynn sends the rookie, me, to go and check it out. So I head up there and this orchestra-esque soundscape begins to play, growing louder and louder the closer I get, until I touch the magical artifact protruding from these floating rocks, and it shows me the magic of space. 
Then we pass out, and then I'm given an iPad to create my character. I called her Luna. She's a ronin snake worshipper with parents that are, in fact, alive. So we take a look around, see if we can find any goodies. I steal a guy's sandwich. Uh, hey, that was my sandwich! Then we head outside to meet the client. Outside we meet Barrett, the person who set up this job and then space pirates attack. It appears that the enemy AI is terrible, a good sign from Bethesda that even after six years since the previous Fallout game, that war indeed never changes. We deal with the pirates and Barrett starts telling me because I touched a rock and saw space magic my job here is done and I need to go to Constellation. Then Barrett and Lynn start bickering about what to do with me. They agree that I can go if Barrett stays here, for some reason. Then Lynn starts speaking to me as if I'm a child, tells me I've been fired, and that I'm a space explorer now, whether I like it or not. Don't you get it? You don't have a job here anymore. You're with those explorers now. Get out of here! Can't you see we don't want you anymore? Why can't you go back where you came from? And leave us alone! Then Barrett gives me a watch, a robot handler named Vasco, and a whole spaceship. I tried asking him why he couldn't just go instead, since he's experiencing the same things as me, but he just told me I'm the main character, and that would be against the rules. I tried to take out my frustrations on them, but it seemed they were invincible. So I took out my anger on the injured scattered around the area. What's wrong with you? Then headed onto the ship with Vasco. We get attacked by space pirates for tutorial purposes, and Vasco informs me that the chances of the pirate chasing us is too high, because they want to steal my new ship. Even though we can just travel at light speed to any necessary location, so we need to go and land the ship they want to steal on the planet where the pirate captain is, for some reason. So we kill the pirate captain, and then head to New Atlantis to reach this constellation. Upon entering the building, we are introduced to some of the other members. Sarah Morgan, Matteo, Noel, and Walter. Sarah begins interrogating me about why I'm here in place of Barrett. Would you care to tell us what happened to our friend? Why you're here and he isn't? Uh, this is just typical. Barrett hands over our ship and our robot to some random employee of that discount mining outfit he uses. Walter. And if we hadn't insisted on installing those emergency protocols, I guarantee you this rock breaker here would be halfway to Neon. See, Mr. Walter here makes a great point. In Oblivion, you are an inmate in the Imperial Prison, being berated by a Dark Elf until Emperor Patrick Stewart shows up to tell you he's been dreaming about you. Let me see your face. You are the one from my dreams. And that you're destined for great things. Then gives you the Amulet of Kings to bring to his son. I can go no further. You alone must stand against the Prince of Destruction and his mortal servants. He must not have the Amulet of Kings. Take the Amulet, give it to Joffrey. He alone knows where to find my last son. Find him and close shut the jaws of oblivion. Then he dies. You exit the prison from the sewers and you're free to do whatever you want. In Fallout 3, you're born into a vault Stuff happens, your father Liam Neeson leaves the vault, then you escape the vault in search of your father. What I do have are a very particular set of skills. Skills that make me a nightmare for people like you. I will look for you. I will find you. Or, don't do that. You're free to explore. New Vegas. Matthew Perry shoots you in the head, and then your quest for revenge begins. Or not. There's a very distinct pattern here. Skyrim, prisoner again, sentenced to death, dragon attack, escape, you are the foretold legendary dragonborn. Nope. 
Fallout 4. You and your wife and child must escape to the vaults before the bombs go off. And while encased in the cryostasis pods, some guy kills your wife and steals your kid. But... Fuck them kids. Fuck the kids? But in Starfield, you're locked into this sequence of tedious events, unable to travel anywhere before heading to Constellation. This linear and condescending handholding is not present in any previous title, which is fine if it's intriguing enough, or even if it's just not too long. But neither of those things are the case. It doesn't work. Nothing about this is interesting. And more importantly, nothing about this makes any sense. Anyway, so they tell me to place my artifact with the others, and then they all start melding together. Then the journey to the next artifact begins, and Sarah says she's coming too. You and I are going to be doing some travelling together. We land on Mars, and before entering the facility, a lady is chasing an invisible entity. Inside the facility, we persuade the bartender who tells us the person we're looking for is actually on Venus. On the way to Venus, we run into some snake worshippers, and I use my own snake worshipping skills to skip the tutorial. And then I tell Sarah I want to check out the moon. So we land on the moon, and would you believe it? There's nothing here. So we wander around in this desolate landscape for a couple of minutes and find an outpost. And ooh, we found a side quest. Apparently, whilst patrolling a moon cave, corrosive vapor started spewing from the ground, and one of the team got left behind in all the chaos. We need to find her as soon as possible. So we run and jump for about, I don't know, another two minutes, then then stumble upon the cave. Inside the cave, we find her injured against a wall. I give her a med pack and she tells us she's good to go and will follow us back. I checked out the rest of the cave to see if there was anything of interest, but nothing. You get used to it. So we head back to the outpost and I return her and receive my payment. Back on the ship, I decided that for this playthrough, I'm just going to do the main quest because that was boring as hell and I'm used to my exploration being rewarded with boring as hell now. We make it to the Star Yard, and inside, things went wrong. And further in, two rival factions are having a shootout, so we partake. We find a voice recording informing us the guy with the artifact we were looking for is also not here. He's actually in a spaceship around Neptune. This is where my footage got corrupted, but don't worry, you didn't miss much, so we'll skip forward and I'll introduce you to two more members of the Constellation crew. This is Samco the Cowboy and Koriko Cowboy's daughter. Noel informs me that my father dropped by to tell me to visit them sometime, and then creepily approaches me for the next minute without saying anything. Then finally informs me my mum also dropped by to tell me to stop by. So I visit them for the first time. As I enter, I see before me some form of foreign sentient life. What? Well, I'll be. Honey, we got ourselves a visitor. Oh my god! Oh, you about gave me a heart attack. Turns out he's my dad, and my mum gives me a backpack and a spacesuit. I then head back to the constellation to return an artifact, and my parents are here for some reason also, and my dad gives me a new gun. Then we take a trip to the eye to visit Vlad the Rad Russian, and we exchange swollen trees, as you do. He tells me I should go and check on another constellation member seeking out an artifact. As I enter the building where she should be, I witness someone providing some excessive force to a corpse. Don't come any closer. Identify yourself. It turns out she's the constellation member I was looking for, named Andresia, and also my future wife. We head further into the mine seeking out the artifact, while stylishly dismantling any Crimson Fleet members in our wake. 
and we obtain the next artifact. You are back. You did not respond when I called to you after you pulled out the artifact. Does that mean Barrett's theory and experience were correct? It is not my intent to distress you. Is this your first time in such a situation? You're too close, man! You're too close, man! Together, we pick up the other artifact Vlad mentioned and then head back to the constellation to drop it off. Then Vlad contacts us to tell us to head back up to the eye again, as he's got some interesting new data. So we head there and he tells us he's found a matching grav anomaly pattern thingy majiggy or whatever, linking it to another planet. On the planet, we come across this unique architecture in the distance, surrounded by strange floating structures. Looking around until locating the entrance, the otherworldly mechanisms begin spiraling and unraveling into a door. Inside, rotating rings begin protruding from the ground, and we need to float into these radiant clusters until the rings stop moving. Then, once we enter the ring, the space magic enters us, and we become Starborn, which is like Dragonborn, but in space. And then we return to Constellation. I show him my Starborn powers, and Vlad tells me there are other temples out there like the one linked to the other artifacts. So eventually I could collect all the Starborn powers and be a super Starborn. Walter pulls me to the side and tells me he's located a cellar of an artifact in the city of Neon and needs my intimidating aura for negotiation purposes. So then we head to Neon. On Neon, we head to Shroud Eklund headquarters to meet Walter's wife, Isa. She informs us we need to head to a nightclub called the Astral Lounge to investigate the cellar and see if we can secure the location for the meeting. And so we enter the Astral Lounge, one of the most unrealistic nightclubs in all of gaming, where patrons wander around with bags and briefcases. The vast majority of the club is filled with the elderly, and three people in vibrant tentacle alien suits dance rhythmically for eternity in the center, and everyone is doing the grocery shopping dance. We head up to the bar, and I manage to convince the bartender to get security on my side in case anything goes wrong. I go back to pick up water and then we head back to the Astral Lounge for the meeting. He tells me we should split up and look for a guy with a briefcase. He then continues to never move from that spot and I begin my search. I noticed a lot more people started bringing briefcases, which makes absolutely no sense because why would you just decide, yeah, let's make other NPCs bring briefcases to the club to confuse the player. They're gonna love that. They're gonna be so confused. It just makes so much sense. Decisions that bring the player entirely out of the game just for the purpose to confuse them are just dumb. You've already killed any semblance of a nightclub. Why would you then piss on its corpse? I finally find the briefcase guy and we head to the meeting upstairs. He suddenly decides the price for the artifact has doubled. So I trigger the doors to close and lock him in and tell him the security team and I have a little understanding. And just like that we have the next artifact. On the way out we get stopped by an employer of some guy named Slayton who threatens us at gunpoint to hand over the artifact. I talk him down, but now it appears his boss has grounded us, and we're stuck in Neon until further notice. With no way to leave, we go and meet this Mr. Slayton. We manage to convince the receptionist at Slayton Aerospace that we have an appointment. It turns out Slayton's figured us out, and has shut down the elevator, but luckily Issa managed to hack in and get us moving again. We head out and follow her directions to attempt to reach Slayton's office. Halfway there, my companions start being weird and start running and get us caught, so we gotta do things the old-fashioned way. We managed to make it out and attempt to stealth again, but Walter decided to run up and punch a guard. Twice. They both miss. Further on, I'm about to kill a guard, but Andresia falls from the sky and intercepts a bullet for him. Yes. Take much more. See? The beauty of the classic Bethesda experience is there will be bugs everywhere and no one player will have the same experience. 
And for the most part, I mean this positively, because it's just hilarious. All of this just works. We finally make it to the office, where Slayton and his guards are there to give us a warm welcome. I manage to talk him down, and him and Walter come to an agreement. To solidify this new partnership, he tells us he's caught the seller of the artifact, and we get to decide his fate. We head through into the office and find him bleeding out. I asked him why he stole the artifact in the first place. Ten years working in aerospace engineering, and they laid me off. You damn right I stole that thing. They tell you if you have talent and commitment, you can go far. But the truth is it's all about who steals the most and gets away with it. Please, I was just trying to sell a product, okay? Isn't that why we're all here? A sad tale. A man brought to his knees, burned by those in power, used and thrown by the wayside like trash. I stab him in the face, and Andresia tells me I'd better loot him in case he's got any goodies. Always worth checking. Never know what you might find in their pockets. On the way out, customers have weapons telling me how hard it is to get a meeting. Not sure what that's about, but good luck to them. Back in the ship, I talk to Walter and Andresia's head, and they're sad that I stab the guy in the face and give me a new gun. Then we take off. On the way back, we get intercepted by an alien-looking spaceship. They tell us they're starborn and have to take the artifact from us. I almost manage to blow them up, but they escape. I drop off the artifact at Constellation, and we have a meeting about the spaceship we just witnessed. They bicker about whether they could be a human colony from undiscovered corners of the universe, aliens, or celestial beings descending from heaven to punish us for seeking too much knowledge. We decide that all we can do now is stay the course and collect artifacts to see if we can learn more about them. Vladimir tells me the eye needs work, so we head up there to do some repairs. He tells me we've got a competitor named Captain Pedrov, owns a vessel called the Scow and is in possession of an artifact. He says he tried to negotiate a trade, but Pedrov isn't willing to make a deal, so looks like we're going to have to steal it. Vlad says I need to take my wife, Andresia, with me. I can't take anyone else, which is a definitive flag that someone in Constellation is about to die. We head out and reach the Scow. I convince them to let us on and head inside to find Pedrov. As we make our way through, it becomes irrefutably apparent that either this game was rushed, or everybody just forgot that maybe they shouldn't structure unique, overarching, plot-heavy locations in the same way the rest of the world is done. Throughout the entire game, there seems to be some form of procedural generation, crowd simulation or whatever, which is understandable for cutting costs in large city areas, maybe and is common in many modern open-world games, such as my experience with Hogwarts Legacy or Cyberpunk on launch. But for isolated, handcrafted locations, more importantly, a one-time main quest location, having numerous duplicates of the same models with the same voice spewing the same lines is actually idiotic and a huge oversight. Continuing through, we reach Pedrov, who informs us he was unaware he had visitors. What? You didn't tell me we had visitors. I convince him to show me his artifact and we head over there. Halfway there, he calls me a filthy pirate and runs off while his clone security tries to gun me down. Of course there was the time I... Filthy pirate! Come down. Meet your death! I thought this was intentional, like some kind of bait ambush. But then I noticed there was a dead clone body in front of the security, and then nothing made sense. It was just a bug. So I restarted. This time, we reach the artifact, and the options are attack, or steal, and then attack. So he patiently waits for me to steal it, he pulls a gun, and we season up his vital organs with lasers and lead until he falls to the ground. And then he lets us go and we leave peacefully with the artifact. Stand down, everyone. Let the nice pirate pass. Filthy pirate. We're not going to forget this. Damn it, Petrov. I was just getting warmed up. So what? 
We're just going to let you loot the ship? Damn pirate. Get what you came for and leave. Who let you on board? But Petrov was done hiring mosquitoes. Now, I have no idea why one of the few named NPCs haven't been updated on what just happened, but the entire clone hive mind is fully aware. Don't ask. What the hell do you think this is? A game that makes sense? God, the captain's gonna love you. Returning to Constellation, Vladimir radios in from the eye. Noel, Starborn, came out of nowhere. Vladimir, get out of there! He already left, said he was going to, uh, to the lodge. What did you do to our friends? They call me the Hunter. And now that I'm here, your part in glimpsing the unity is over. I'm already on my way. Say goodbye to your friends. It won't be long. We're given the option to defend the lodge or head to the eye. I decide to stay at the lodge, and Walter graciously gets into position to get grabbed by a Starborn. By the way, this Starborn and his duplicate is immune to all damage, and on my first playthrough I spent 50 minutes fighting him in a sewer. We head downstairs through the underground to the well. It seems a lot of people just don't care about what's going on at all. We make our way through the spaceport to the ship and head to the eye we get intercepted by a Starborn, who seems to be so impressed by my ability to escape that he lets me go and tells me to keep collecting artifacts because I'm the main character. We make our way into the eye, and Barrett's dead. I... I, I can't... I can't do this. Why did this have to happen? He's... he's gone. So I got curious and wondered what would happen if I had headed there first. Everyone's injured, but not dead. So I head back to the lodge, and Andresia's dead, and the previously injured Sarah that I'm pretty sure I left back on the eye casually walks past Andresia's corpse. And I wasn't going to mention the bug that happened with Barrett's corpse, but I don't think it's a bug, because this happened on every playthrough. So that's just Bethesda stuff. <laughs> oh no. <sighs> Obviously, I'm not leaving Andresia dead, so this will be the last time we'll see Barrett. Noel and Vladimir put me in charge of the artifacts to avoid being attacked again, and I put it on my ship for easy escapes. Back on New Atlantis, we can see the carnage the Starborn and, I guess, me left in our wake. At the lodge, Matteo has some new information. If I may. I know our encounter with the Hunter is the last thing anyone wants to talk about right now, but he said something that I can't get out of my mind. Unity. Do you remember that? I've heard that word before. It's an important concept in Keeper Aquilus' speeches. The priest? Is the Sanctum Universum going to bless our little crusade of discovery? It can't be a coincidence. The Sanctum has always believed that answers are out there in the stars. Look, I know it's the longest of shots and the biggest leap of faith I could ever ask us all to take, but why not talk to him? So, basically, we need to find out what the true meaning of unity is by first talking to a priest. He described an old tale he's heard involving a pilgrim. The pilgrim meets with the House of Enlightenment who are an organization of atheists that spread across the settled systems to preach that humanity should take care of each other. Then he meets with the cult of the Varun. They believe in a god called the Great Serpent. He gives each one of them one part of the truth, and then departs to his final resting place, to live out the rest of his days in quiet contemplation. So now we got to figure out a way to break the code and find the pilgrim's resting place. Then we get the info we need from this lady and this guy and then head for where the pilgrim is. Then we find some books and then we do some quiz stuff to open a door to get the info we need. And then we find the final piece of the puzzle revealing that the Starborn attacking us was in fact also the pilgrim. So we head to the location where we will find the truth. 
Then this insect alien thingy escorts us to a puzzle, and we do the puzzle thing, which gives us direction to the true truth. In space, we meet the Starborn. He invites us on the ship to speak with him and another Starborn. I'll be honest, this entire previous section was boring as hell, so I apologise if I just sound like I don't wanna. Because I didn't wanna. Anyway, we're on the ship now, yay. So the Hunter, aka the Starborn that's been attacking us, aka also the Pilgrim, aka also the Priest, introduces us to the Emissary. Now, before we continue, if you'll pay close attention to the top of his head, we can see that that's Barrett. Ooh, there it is. The big reveal. A uh, light skin variant of Barrett? Or is it the suit? Barrett explains that he's not the same Barrett I know, and that in his universe, he was the one that stayed at the lodge, whilst I went and died on the eye. Which could explain why the hunter decided to let me go after his attack on the lodge. My survival was unprecedented in every other universe until now. He tells us there are many, many Starborns, people that have passed through this unity, allowing travel between universes. They're all seeking out the artifacts at any cost, killing, stealing, deceiving to collect pieces to craft this armillary, allowing for use of the unity and thus we reach the moral dichotomy between the Emissary and the Hunter. The Emissary believes only the righteous and worthy should be allowed to use the unity, and be allowed to utilise the powers the artefacts give, yet will still commit any manner of crimes to achieve that goal. The Hunter, on the other hand, simply wants the artefacts for himself, will do anything to get them and believes the strongest will prevail. Ah, yeah, I already spoiled that, apologies. They give me a choice. When the time comes, I'll need to side with one of them, or choose my own path. Before I leave, I'm given a key to seek the moon of old earth. There are some things I need to discover for myself. I make a stop at the lodge to update everyone on what's going on, and Vladimir gives me two more artifact locations. So I head to the earth's moon and the information received on the moon leads me to NASA. THE NASA on Earth. Side note, it is absolutely hilarious that there's now just a singular structure with a fully intact rocket attached to it on this previously desolate Earth. Just because I got some information, a new location is available? This applies to multiple points of interest. The only way to go to specific locations on Earth is to find information about them in-game. Locations like the Empire State Building, or the Leaning Tower of Pisa, or the Great Pyramid of Giza, and then they magically materialise. Simply put, the Earth is just there to be an easter egg, but that doesn't really aid anything in terms of lore. In fact, the complete opposite, which we'll discover after heading into this NASA facility. As we make our way through, we discover voice recordings and diary entries, and piece together what exactly happened to Earth. An unsettling delivery from Mars sets in motion a chain of events that will forever alter the course of humanity. Dr. Judith Tatien, an astrophysicist, is intrigued by a mysterious delivery brought by Dr. Victor Isa. I was expecting hoax samples or maybe fossils of microbial life. Instead, Dr. Victor Isa comes with two members of the military. Everything they brought back is under wraps. What could a theoretical physicist need with a sample from Mars? Days later, Judith receives an invitation from Isa, inviting her to this lab. Four hours talking to Victor and his team about theoretical metals, atomic bonding, even a half-hour divergence into magnetism that I'm pretty sure was just to me on the trail of what we were actually talking about. Then, I got to see the lab. I... I don't know how much I should say, but the periodic table just got thrown out the window. They begin collaborating on the development of the grav drive, the ability to fold and pull space. 
creating a shortcut between two distant points in the universe. Intergalactic travel. My brain's not powerful enough for this, so just watch Interstellar. So as they continue to conduct tests, unintended consequences become apparent. I just need you to trust me. I have been trusting you. We keep slamming our heads against a brick wall, getting nothing. And you keep coming up with something new to try. Like, you know what's going to happen. Where are you getting your information, Victor? I'm sorry, Judith. I... Look, not here, okay? Somewhere off base. I'll tell you everything. But I'm not lying, okay? We're going to discover something important here. I promise. The data coming back from the satellites is very clear. It's the ground drive. All those jumps from the moon. At this rate, Earth's atmosphere is going to start sputtering out into space. Can the drives be fixed? I'm working on some designs that should discreetly solve the problem. Under the guise of an emergency update to the fueling pumps. We're talking about the end of Earth. And you're trying to be subtle about it. Judith, the last thing we need is people losing faith in grab drive technology. That might be our only option. To what? Are you seriously saying we should abandon Earth? The timeline is under 50 years. You know, didn't you? You lied to me. I... All this time, I dedicated my life to this discovery, Victor. And you knew we were going to kill off our planet? You haven't seen the future I've seen. There isn't a planet in this universe that will be far enough away from you, Victor. We are never speaking again after this is over. Earth will be uninhabitable in 50 years. They had 50 years to get as many people off Earth as possible. And that's how humanity was forced to find its place in the stars. We find all the answers we need in Dr. Isa's final diary entry. He confesses he headed a retrieval team to Mars, responding to an odd gravitational anomaly. He stumbled upon this anomaly, an artifact. He met himself or another variant of himself from another universe, a starborn. The starborn spoke of the grav drive, how to create it, and the disastrous consequences that would occur if it were to be realized. But also spoke of a vibrant city, thriving on a planet orbiting a distant star. The progression of human culture, art, music and lifestyles evolving and radiating brightly across the vast expanse of space. And Isa was willing to pay that price, believing that we had a place among the stars, a sacrifice worthy of the expansion of humanity. And so we obtain the final artifact make our way out of the facility whilst being pursued by Starborn along the way. Outside, we meet the hunter and the emissary once again, but this time, a choice must be made. The hunter argues that this was the best outcome, the possibility of losing Earth regardless, to war, famine or disease and so on could certainly be a possibility, and in those instances, with no grab drive, nobody could have made it off of Earth. Humanity simply ceasing to exist as the universe lives on. Why have one volatile world when you can have all the settled systems? The Emissary, on the other hand, says the power of the artifacts forced humanity to the stars. They didn't get to make a choice. How many would have chosen Earth? And what gave Victor the right to choose for them? And then we decide side with the emissary or side with the hunter, or choose neither and fight both of them to reach the unity. This time around I chose neither and made my way to the endgame. I also attended Barrett's funeral, but that's whatever. 
<laughs> no. Before we can make it to the planet, I'm intercepted by them both. After the intense battle, they retreat, and I make my way down and head further in. We make our way past what looked to be a battlefield, paved with blood and filled with the ecliptic faction's corpses. They were likely manipulated or funded by rival Starborns. Further in, we're ambushed by the Starborn working for the Emissary and the Hunter, and after taking them out, make our way through the gauntlet, taking out everyone in our way. We stumble upon an anomaly and take a step inside. Inside is a separate timeline, and we're back at the beginning of the game, just before Lin sends us off to check out the artifact. I finally get my revenge for Lin condescendingly firing slash promoting me, and Hela presents his ass to me graciously. Oh. Pressing forward, I run into another anomaly. This time we're back on Pedro's ship, but this time he says we have visitors with a V. We have visitors! What does that mean? He says I am unworthy to reach the Unity, and then I kill him and his clone guards. In the final anomaly, we see Vladimir holding another timeline's me in his arms. So I leave him to mourn and continue. There is a very conveniently placed stockpile of more than enough guns, ammunition and medicine, which means it's final boss time. I get stocked up and then head in. Then I need to fight through a bunch of my duplicates. Once they're dead, I can head through and meet with the Hunter and Emissary for the final time. Now there are two options, attack or persuade. This time I chose to persuade, and I'm reminded why I hate the persuasion system so much. It really just feels like I'm choosing random sentences with varying degrees of success based on RNG, which is true, but unlike persuasion checks on less relevant NPCs, this is the main quest. Why can my arguments not be more nuanced and contextual? Another reason this feels so lukewarm is, if you chose to attack, you'd get to enjoy a pretty unique boss fight where you're thrust into multiple timelines and locations, and once you take out either or one of them, you're rewarded with a piece of their unique, legendary equipment. But with the speech minigame, that's just not the case, you get nothing. And so we grab the final artifact, and to reach the Unity, we need to place it on our ship and activate the grab drive. Now, the first time around, I sided with the Hunter. He joined me on my ship, then attacked my crew and killed me. Quit it! Okay, uh, that hurt! Oh, I'm hit! Those won't even scar! Uh, 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 had worse. No, I'm not. Fighting you! And I thought, huh? Wait, he actually betrays you? No, that was a bug. All of this just Anyway, I activate the grab drive and we finally reach the Unity. We're given two options, to remain here and live out our lives, or traverse through the Unity and awaken in a new universe, whilst the you you once were ceases to exist. But even though the you ceases to exist in this universe, you do have an impact. We're shown the long-term effects we've made here. Then we can pass through the unity. After the credits roll, we're met with this text box, telling us that our story has begun anew, and that the only thing we've brought through the unity is our memories and experiences. We have a new starborn spaceship and a new suit. We head to Constellation, and Sarah greets us with two options. Repeat the main quest, or skip it. If you choose to repeat the main quest, you do it all over again. Except now, with your Starborn knowledge, you'll gain some new flavour text. You're also able to skip mission steps or objectives with new Starborn dialogue options. The one main difference in repeating the main quest is you have the option of saving both companions. Now, if you skip the main quest, you simply 
tell them everything, get a couple of artifact locations from Vladimir, go to more than likely recycled locations to pick up those artifacts again, then head straight to the meeting with the emissary and hunter again, make your choice, enter the unity, do it again and again and again until you get bored. But honestly, you should have got bored the first time around. So, what changes in these new universes? What is the point exactly? Well, in each new universe, constellation can be altered in a variety of ways. For example, you may enter the lodge and this time the hunter has killed everyone. Or everyone at the lodge has been replaced by copies of yourself. Or everyone has become a child. Or Sarah has become a literal plant. There are 10 variations of these, and each new game you enter, you have a 15% chance of getting one of these variants. Interesting. The big issue here is, these events are completely isolated within the lodge. Your intrigue in everyone becoming a child is limited to a few minutes of new dialogue. You can take your clone with you as a companion outside of the lodge, but once outside, there is nothing new. You can't go and visit your parents and have any new, meaningful occurrences. Your twin from this universe doesn't know your parents or their parents. There is nothing new in the universe outside of the lodge in terms of characters or story. What is new is you're allowed to go and get more starborn powers from temples or get duplicates and upgrade your current powers with longer durations or damage or whatever. In each new universe, you'll get upgraded armor with RNG legendary stats and ship upgrades. So, let's wrap this up in a nice little bow. Taking all of this into account, what is the purpose? I don't know. It doesn't make any sense. But, here's what I can gather. Starfield is not an RPG Bethesda game. You complete the main quest, pick a meaningless outcome, go through the unity with only a 15% chance of being met by a new variation of the lodge. If you skip the main quest, go to multiple recycled locations, run through the RNG planets for a few minutes, get the artifact from the RNG locations, make your meaningless decision with the hunter and emissary, fight through the underground temple again, pick up all the necessary guns and ammo you need from the stockpile, pick up some medicine, including some personality meds if, you know, maybe this time you want to speed up the process by just passing the speech check. Rinse and repeat. If you didn't skip the main quest, do it all over again, but with more chances to skip sections of the game. Let's look at this from the actual perspective of a Starborn. The main objective of a majority of Starborn is to simply gain more power, all fighting each other to upgrade and gain new space magic spells, then passing through the unity to do it again and again. It's pretty understandable that the hunter would eventually get bored of that and turn into a priest and just live his life when you look at it that way. What are you going to do with all that power? because from what we've been made to witness within this story, it looks pretty boring. And the thing is, from a player's perspective, it's even more atrocious. Because every system in Starfield is telling the player they can't have fun. How do you stay in one universe when all your experiences are muddied by loading screen after loading screen and the same exact locations? doing the same poorly yet lengthy written side quests that send you through those multiple loading screens, hardly ever being rewarded with something of interest. Your relationships with your companions are meaningless. You sleep with your wife and she glitchingly awakens from her slumber telling you how you rocked their world on repeat, then randomly gifts you with money or potatoes. <sighs> Last night, well... All that physical training seems to have paid off. Here, I have something for you. I saw it earlier and thought you might like it. You're nothing but a prostitute. But then, 
how do you go through the unity to be met with basically the exact same scenario, the only difference is you've lost all your gear and ships you've spent hours on, and relationships. See, when I go back and I replay Oblivion or Fallout, I know I have more to do, and I know it will be worth the investment. Starfield cannot remotely offer that, and it could have, and if not in the way it used to be, then with its new spin on multiverses. You know, actually change the universe, change storylines, switch characters, add new, unique quests to discover, because the way the main quest is structured heavily lends itself to the idea that you should be speedrunning the main quest to discover new universes. But then you're only rewarded with new powers and better stats. That's not an RPG Bethesda game. I think that's why Starfield lends itself to being a completely different game than it is. It has elements of different genres, none fleshed out to the levels they should be whilst lessening or neutering elements that it's assumed to be. There are some very interesting sections of the game, but in those sections, the story is linear and more focused. Then you have space sim mechanics with a very odd amount of depth in what you can create, yet a very limited amount of what you can actually do. You have, I think, deep building mechanics with outposts and resource management. You can explore over 1,000 planets, just, you know, not really do anything on them. It feels like you have many ideas, but none polished enough to complement each other and none thought through enough to stand on their own, along with an engine and an approach incapable of facilitating this new vision for a Bethesda game. Todd Howard said, I do think for us, particularly me, going into a science fiction game, I want to be able to land on all the planets. I want the game to say yes to us, knowing that that content is going to be different than what you've seen from us in the past. This line of thinking holds absolutely no weight if what we're being told yes to is a plentiful amount of nothingness. It's like having the ability to perceive the entire universe, but never once taking a closer look. Never once looking at what's on the surface. You're not an active participant. And this disconnect makes me wonder for the future of Bethesda. Elder Scrolls 6 is in the works, and with the success of the Fallout TV show, Fallout 5 will likely be on the way too. But the last Elder Scrolls game was 13 years ago. And the last single-player Fallout game was 9 years ago. And to me, Fallout 4 already had some questionable evolutions. Fallout 76's launch was filled with bugs as usual, but also had some very malicious monetization practices. Hopefully not relevant to a single-player experience, but it shows a change in priorities as does Starfield. So, think back and remember when you used to journey off the beaten path, where you'd stumble upon a little village. Curious, you'd talk to all the residents and learn something was off. Maybe one of the villagers went missing in a cave, or maybe they're a cult luring weary wanderers to an underground cavern under the local inn, to sacrifice them to a lion named Puss. Believing that this is the cause of the recent bountiful harvest they've been having, whatever you do, whatever outcome you reach, beat the Puss, free the Puss, or kill the Puss, you find a letter on a broken and bloodied corpse leaning against a rock, a recent victim of the puss. And the letter is from the victim's sister, informing them to simply bring back some apples from the local store. So you take it upon yourself to go to the address on the letter, thus leading you to a whole new location with new and interesting stories to immerse yourself into. This cycle continues because everything feels alive, and because everything has a story, 
and also just because breadcrumbs are nice. Now, imagine a city filled with crowd-simulated, nameless NPCs, all glaring at you with uncanny or duplicate faces, regaling you with platitudes as you walk past, sometimes even overshadowing each other, reinforcing the artificial world you're attempting to live in. They have no homes, they aimlessly wander, They exist to make you feel that the world is dense and alive, whilst convincing you of the exact opposite. You're thrown an abundance of quests with no nuance, providing no intrigue or reason to invest past just completing a set list of tasks. An experience reminiscent of trying to reach max level in most MMOs, sent to numerous locations, pulled from a pool of preset buildings and layouts. The fatigue gradually setting in, and as you can't continue squinting to avoid the peripheral truth, eventually, you finally witness the big picture. This is the Bethesda experience, now. I mean, it's pretty, but space is pretty. Precious. It should be more than pretty. Whether your own jaded preconceptions or biases or not, the unfortunate truth is, this is not unlikely. In fact, considering Bethesda's current path and modern open world games in general, we're veering towards it. Only time will tell. I should also mention, you may have noticed I didn't cover mods in this video. That's because I believe a game should never be dependent on its modding community. Developers shouldn't rely on the community to create unofficial fixes or add content that they neglected or overlooked. Almost all Bethesda games can be enhanced with mods from quality of life to content and cosmetics. But that should never allow anyone to think modders can or should fix a game. When you look at Starfield, it's a lot of empty space, literally. I have no doubt a large community of people experienced and interested enough could create some incredible content, whole new cities on previously barren planets with storylines and so on. But objectively, the potential for modding should be seen as a bonus not a factor in assessing the game's core qualities. It's the same as releasing an unfinished game, then gradually patching it to the state it should have been on release. Or not even doing that, making bank on pre-orders and early access deluxe editions. That's just bad practice, and I'd hate for that to become the norm. Also, this video is before the car was added to the game. So if you wondered why I spent three minutes running to nothing instead of driving to nothing, that's why. So yeah, that's the video. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. And if you'd like to see more, be sure to subscribe.